Welcome to the Writers' Center's virtual craft chat series, where we talk with writers a little less about what they wrote and a little more about how they wrote it. Uh, my name is Zach Powers. I am uh, the artistic director of the Writers' Center, but I am also a novelist uh, with some similarities, I think, to the novel we'll be discussing today in terms of, of my book and, and, and fiction writer in general. And that's why I get to have this wonderful conversation and to welcome now uh, Vanessa Hua, the author of Forbidden City, which has been just an absolute pleasure to read. So Vanessa, I wanna thank you so much for joining us and for agreeing to, to dive into the nitty gritty of your book to talk about uh, how you wrote a little bit. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Jack, uh, uh, Zach, for hosting me and for all of you for coming out this afternoon or tonight. It, it's really exciting to be able to talk about the book. Yeah. Uh, do you have a copy of your, advanced copy of your book handy yes. to read from? Yes. Uh, um, so if you could just read us a brief excerpt just to give people a taste of, of what we'll be talking about, since no one has probably read it at this point in the group. Yes, um, except for my editor who's on the call. <laughs> um, okay, I'll, I'm just going to read from the prologue. The chairman is dead. September 9th, 1976. Outside, the people of Chinatown are cheering. They light firecrackers and beat pots and pans, chanting as they march three floors down below the window of my apartment in San Francisco. Their signs say, smash the emperor and smash the party. Drips of paint spoil the sweep and curve of the characters bleeding as if shot. The cheering swells, the revelers giddy with rice wine and easy victory. No longer will they whisper the chairman's name, afraid of his reach here across the ocean to America. No longer will they invoke his name to scare their children or as a curse against their enemies. They didn't hate the chairman at first. None of us did. In the beginning, he was the beginning. He dared to make the sun and moon shine in new skies, to end hunger and superstition in China, to end all that made us weak. That's just a hint from the beginning. Thank you so much, and and I, I'm glad I'm glad you mentioned the prologue because I might bring something up from that a little bit later. But I, I, I thought it was a really good prologue. It's very Thank short. You. I, you, you read a short bit of it. And it's a very short prologue too, but very. Uh, you had my interest so well so early, so that that's really interesting. Great. But to, about you, real quick, just in your own words, in lieu of me reading a bio, biography, um, who are you? I'm the American-born daughter of Chinese immigrants, the mother of twins and born and raised in the Bay Area. I'm a columnist for the San Francisco Chronicle and Forbidden City is my third book. I also wrote A River of Stars and Deceit and Other Possibilities. Great, thank you. So the first question we like to ask our authors is sometimes the one they dislike the most. So we get out of the way, it's the band, ripping off the Band-Aid. Uh, what's a question you really wish someone would ask you about your writing or writing practice? In other words, what haven't you gotten to speak about before? You know, actually this question comes at the end of quite a few <laughs> interviews. So I, in some ways I do feel like I've, I've answered many questions, um, but I guess uh, something that, um, that often people are curious about in terms of a writer's practice, they're always uh, thinking about, oh, what are some tips or techniques? And those are certainly things I can discuss uh, on tonight, but, I'm thinking it's interesting, like having this event during the pandemic, just thinking about the ways in which um, a question about how you kind of keep yourself whole as a, as a writer, as a, as a person, because I think so much of it, um, our identity, it, so much is at stake for us, right, in, in embarking on this year's long project, but really thinking about, or as I've come um, at this point in my career to to understand how to, to manage all that and, and to understand that, um, that it's important to, th that sometimes you do need to stop and the walk that you take will make better pages in the end than if you stayed all the way uh, until you fell asleep. If, I, I find if I, and this always happens, if I, if I work after in, in bed or after dinner, then that's kind of, I'm shot the rest of the night. So, um, because I'm a morning person. And so I think it's, I don't know if I did the Jeopardy uh, in terms of game show, in terms of coming up with the question, but I felt like um, that was a question that hasn't quite been addressed to me yet in terms of just thinking, how do you, if you're at this point in your career, how do you, how do you keep going so that it's, it's healthy and that you keep work, 
you know, you're, you're still excited and have the energy for all that you are responsible for in your life. That's a great and important answer and one we probably don't talk about enough as writers, especially yeah. in pandemic times. So thank you. Um, so just to, for my next question, just a quick thing, I'm gonna mention my book and my book is set in an alternate history of the Soviet space program, probably somewhat contemporary to the, the timeline of your novel. Mm -hmm. there, you mentioned Khrushchev, Khrushchev appears as yes. a character in my novel. And, and so I'm gonna mention my novel a couple of times, but only in the fact that I think there are some, we probably had some similarities in, in our research practices and how we did this. I feel mine's a little faker. My, my premise is a little more, more made <laughs> it's up. It's all than a spectrum, premise. right. But, but uh, I also feel like, like when I hear the term historical fiction, your book feels more like my book than my book feels like historical fiction, if that makes sense. So I, I was very excited to have some of these questions. I feel like we can have almost a, pers a more personal dialogue and sometimes I get. So that's just a quick, a quick introduction to my book. Let's ignore it now and talk about your book. Um, so I sort of want to talk about fact versus truth. And so many readers wanted to know the true parts of my novel, uh, of which there are some, but there are a lot more made up parts. But I didn't, I didn't really care about that when I was writing. And you say in your author's note at the end, I believe that fiction flourishes where the official record ends and that research should serve as the floor and not the ceiling of the imagination. I love that. That was like, that's the thing I was doing and not, I didn't have that phrase. You articulated it so well. So I guess broadly, what's your relationship to what really happened to the historical record as you were working on this project? Well, I think I should also preface it that since I'm a journalist and when I work in nonfiction, it's always very clear to me that whatever I uh, write in, in that genre is, you know, fully documented or it's recorded somewhere. But I think, as I mentioned in my author's note and what you just read aloud, uh, fiction can go where the official record ends. Um, and I'm not even talking about the facts. I'm, I'm talking about interiority or getting at who a character is beyond the iconic images. And that's that's really where the power is. And so in terms of uh, my relationship to the truth as it pertains to Forbidden City, I wanted to get at the truth of somewhat, of an impoverished young girl who uh, was emblematic of so many of the millions of women who are never even a footnote in history and yet can shape the course of history in their own way. Um, and so, you know, in terms of the novel, it kind of roughly tracks the timeline of, of major events, say, in, in the, you know, at the start of the Cultural Revolution. And, but for example, I wasn't going to make Mao be able to fly. Like that wasn't my interest. So, um, and in fact, I didn't even call uh, the character Mao Zedong. He's, he's the chairman in the novel for various reasons. Uh, but one of which is I felt it was a way for me to make the character my own. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Because in my novel, the chief designer, Sergei Korolev of the Soviet Pace Program is just called the chief designer. And it's a point that you don't know his name though, because that was also, that was actually a fact <laughs> that his name was not known publicly that I ran okay. with beyond. So, uh, but, but do, do you think uh, titling him that way and allowed you to inhabit him more fully? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it definitely gave you some leeway because almost all the other characters are made up completely. So he was one of the few, uh, one of the few main characters who was actually based on a real person. So um, yeah, that's interesting. So did you have like a threshold of accuracy when you were uh, recounting actual events? I mean, did, uh, how far did you let yourself diverge from history maybe when you were working uh, with scenes or settings? To use that metaphor of the floor versus the ceiling, I think um, if anything, that was I, I would use those historical events as a as a jumping off point. But on, on the same hand, I also learned not to get too much into the weeds. For example, there's many books that I did read in the course of the of research for the novel, you know, thick tomes where it talks about meetings where they're discussing personnel, and it's just. It's, I'm glad it's in the historical record, but it's not germane to the story I'm telling about May. Yeah, I think that's important too. And, and, and on the other hand though, I think there's, how do you balance telling a compelling moving story while also educating an audience who maybe doesn't know the subject? And I, and I, should, I should admit that I was, I was on Google a lot because I, there were glaring holes in my knowledge of the Cultural Revolution and, and, and previous events as well. So I was like, I'm playing catch up now because I really don't know a lot of the details here. 
So how do you balance that, uh, uh, what an audience needs to know with telling a good story? Well, and I, I love actually that you were uh, hypertexting or Googling alongside the novel. I think that is something I'll do as well, um, whether the novel is contemporary or not, uh, because it's a sign that the, the text is engaging, the character is engaging, and you kind of, I don't know, maybe you're sometimes you're looking for a, a spoiler, like, is, is she going to be okay? What, what's going to happen? Um, and I think, um, let me just say that uh, I entered the writing the novel, uh, having grown up in the US, not getting an education about the Cultural Revolution either. And so it was a matter of fully understanding something that on one hand is iconic, who hasn't seen the young teenagers waving uh, little red books, uh, you know, what, what, what happened, like something happened in China that was big, Mao, just, but it, in time, as I entered this character, and as I began to do more research, I began to realize or understand the root causes and figured out how to embody that through the journey and life of, of my character. And I think that's, you, you, and, and no one person is going to have experienced everything that happened in a country at a certain time. So again, it's thinking about what makes the most sense for the character. For me, character is, is paramount, whether or not it's historical fiction. Okay. Um, I have some more questions. I did want to mention that we absolutely welcome audience questions. So if you have questions at any point, please type them into the chat window. And I'll get to as many, if not all of those questions that show up in the chat window. And I would much rather ask your questions than mine because I expect yours are more interesting and insightful. So please put those in the chat window as soon as you have them. I may not answer them, ask them immediately, but I'll, get, I'll try to get to as many as possible. Uh, but I'll go to my other questions right now as you're thinking up your own. So you mentioned research there and, and research process is something that, you know, I research pretty much whenever I write anything, but, you know, a project like Forbidden City, uh, or my novel definitely required a level of research, which was not something I had done previously. Uh, and I realized when I was doing it how much information I collected but didn't use, but how that was still useful to me. Uh, even if I never typed it into a Word document, the fact that I had built up this just broader knowledge. And it reminds me too, when I'm, when I'm teaching like freshman composition, um, I'm always like, the easiest way to write a paper is to become an expert on the subject. And freshmen have such a hard time understanding that like, I need to find facts to and pull these little facts together. But like, you just read everything and learn it. Then you can talk as an authority on the subject and pull in the quotes when you need. Anyway, I'm off there on my pedagogical aside about teaching freshman composition. Um, how much made it into your manuscript versus how much got left out in terms of research? How much more research? You already said this a little bit with the minutia of meeting detail, meaning minutes almost, but uh, how much stuff that maybe you thought you might lose didn't get included? I think even just recently, I was cleaning out this, the drawer in my desk where I'd written down Chinese nicknames <laughs> that I'd come across in some research paper, thinking maybe they'll be useful. Um, but I think it's probably akin to an iceberg. Even though the book's 368 pages, it's still just the tip of what I found. Uh, but I don't think of any of it is wasted, nor do I think, say, any of the drafts I wrote were wasted either, because I needed to have, you know, absorbed and moved through that research or through those drafts in order to arrive at the book I have now. Mm -hmm. um, so the other thing that, another thing that I was, an area of research we don't always think of when we think of research, we tend to think of figures and events and but there's a lot of great grounding detail in the book, uh, uh, as well as setting details, and they're historical. And I'm thinking of the historical setting details of the lake palaces on page 24 and elsewhere, but uh, throughout the book, there's just moments where I felt really well grounded in settings that I had no real personal experience to draw from. So I was definitely, I thought this was a masterful use of, of detail, but I'm wondering how you research things like detail and setting as opposed to characters and events. I mean, that's an interesting question. And so, for example, I went to China, and even though the Lake Palace is what the Forbidden City is in the book, um, is not open to the public, I walked its high red walls the whole entire length to get a sense of its vastness. I visited other traditional Chinese gardens to get a sense. Um, at one point, I was even uh, taking photos in a botanical garden to get, to get a sense of the, the greenery. 
And so I think obviously there's a lot that uh, you can see online, but going there can, can bring the setting to life. But I will say this, uh, I wrote the first draft of the book, including a moment on these mud flats in Hong Kong before I'd ever gotten there. But I got this research grant, grad school, and I went, and it was the eeriest feeling. It was as I had imagined, and it was almost as if I had willed it into being. And I don't, I didn't, I don't have such, such magical powers, but I think it speaks to the power of imagination, um, whether it's depicting setting or whether it's depicting character, how to make that empathetic leap. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I once envisioned taking a research trip or getting a grant, and then I decided I a lot of my research had to be in the middle of Kazakhstan, <laughs> inaccessible by anything. It's like, I'm not going to survive this. I suffer motion sickness. I'm probably not going to survive a road trip over whatever dirt road it takes to get to the bike under Kazakhstan. Anyway, so I didn't, I didn't do that. But again, fortunately, there are pictures and things I could access. The Google is an amazing document. Oh, uh, and I did that, want to add some other, th yeah. uh, something else too. I think often, whether it's setting, um, I found I used the visceral to try and understand my characters. So as you quickly learn in the novel, the chairman is a fan of ballroom dancing. And believe it or not, it was one of those popular classes at Stanford at fresh, my freshman year. It's still one of the most popular classes on campus. And so the scenes in which I'm writing about dance, I it's embodied. I, I have felt it. I have done it as well. Or the way the chairman, there's a scene I portray uh, uh, where he, um, it's uh, this famous swim that that kicks off the cultural revolution. In my 20s, I, I was a big runner, but I injured my foot and I started taking swim lessons. I eventually ran a triathlon and all that. But again, I had a sense of, I took that knowledge and used that to to understand my characters and their setting and what it, it must be like to to pass through these landscapes or to pass through these motions. I mean, I think that's a great interpretation of write what you know, which isn't to stick to necessarily what you really, really personally know, but recognize where the things you know apply to the thing you're writing about. Yeah. And that's and and I think that's that's a beautiful way to think about that. So thank you. Um, just in in terms of research, we have some good questions coming in, so we can go to those in just a second. Uh, just the research process. How much of your research? So it's I guess initial versus ongoing research. How much did you do before you ever started writing? You mentioned some, you had written some things before you'd been to China that ended up matching. How much did you do during the writing process? And did you have any like additional little bits of research you had to do even during revision to flush things out or, or correct things? Well, I suppose, I, I think I'd like to explain how this book, what would even inspired uh, Forbidden City. I think that would uh, be helpful to the discussion. About 15 years ago, I was watching a documentary about China for another project I had in mind, but have since uh, put aside. And up pops this photo of Chairman Rao surrounded by giggling teenage girls. And they're sort of dressed like bobby soxers in these fitted tops, plaid skirts. And I was completely astonished. And it turned out that they, that Mao, as, as we've discussed, was a fan of ballroom dancing. And he had special troops of young women with whom he partnered with on the dance floor and in the bedroom. And in terms of research, I, there wasn't much. I read uh, the chairman's physician's memoir. And in it, he says, oh, for these women, it was the most exhilarating experience of their life. And I knew it had to be, there was a story there that it had to be more complicated than that, that sort of dismissive tone that he took, um, especially since some of them ended up being companions to the chairman, uh, his nurses, confidential clerks, handling his correspondence. And so that one photo started me off on this 14 year journey. And at the time I was a grad student, I checked out every book I could uh, through interlibrary loan. I remember I got a book in Chinese and I, I, I think I mailed it to my dad and told him to, to read it and tell me what was there. Um, I also got that grant and was able to go to China. Um, so many books over the long process. Uh, or also um, at one point I read, I think the front page of every, New York Times from every China story from the New York Times from 1955 to 1966. I mean, there's in some ways over that period of researching the book more got online, uh, you know, and so it was a mix. Um, I, I think sometimes, 
and I have talked to students or, or friends who are like, oh, I, I really want to write X, Y, Z, but I still need to find out something and something that seems impossible is, unless you have a time machine. And I think while research is very important, was a huge part of my book, at a certain point, you have to get at the core of what only you can tell, what isn't in any research. And that's, again, where the power of fiction lies. That's great. You mentioned something in the beginning of that answer too about you recognize there was something complicated going on, more complicated than, than the account from the doctor. Yeah. Um, but I also like something just really struck with me there too, that like there's the sort of black and white historical record. And sometimes the story is in that place where you recognize there's something much more complicated and human going on than that black and white record could account for. And I think that's something that the novel does really well, that, that we're, we're constantly in that complicated human area area that's underlying the black and white of the human record. And, yeah. and that, that's uh, that's really interesting to me. Novelists love the gray areas. We, we live there, that's what we do. Yeah. Um, so uh, first question from the chat, what's a craft element that you love that you used when writing Forbidden City? It's a tough one. You know, right before I got on the Zoom, I was writing a letter to one of my students at, at Warren Wilson and thinking, so I've been thinking about craft all day actually until we, we got here. Um, I don't know. I don't know if it's like saying which one of my kids is my favorite. <laughs> um, but I think I, I, um, I, you know, setting dialogue, all, I mean, all those uh, interiority. Um, I, I don't know if I can pick just one. I, I, I think um, there were times where maybe I leaned too hard. I remember in some very late revision, I realized to my horror, I had five metaphors in a row. <laughs> and I think it's because I had moved a bunch of things uh, around. And so, um, so yeah, I, I don't know if it's a cop out, but I, uh, I feel like through this process, I was able to uh, really work on different cast elements to to bring uh, alive her character and and this world. Great. Uh, another question from the chat, and I like this one. How closely did the story you ended up with resemble the story you thought you were writing when you set out? It's interesting. Sometimes I'll um, I'll see lines in the book where I remember where I wrote it. That some of them lasted even from grad school. So, so somewhere written between 2000, I mean, what else in our lives do we have that exists for, for that long? Um, but I, I think maybe one way of thinking about it is um, like some major revisions that I took that uh, with the help of my editor, that for example, I think in the earliest versions, there is a, a bet of sorts between the chairman and his assistant, but it was closer to the sort of bet in My Fair Lady, where it was two men discussing something. But I began to realize there needed to be a point to it, a greater point to it, rather than uh, sort of an academic exercise, let's say, like a bet settled between two men. And, and so that was really important. Um, and another uh, element that came out during revision later in the process was understanding who May is addressing the book to. and. Often when I'm working with students, it's important to consider who not I'm not even talking about the audience of the imagined reader, but is there someone the narrator is speaking to? And if you can and if you can determine that, uh, that will qualify and add urgency to the narrator's journey, why they need to tell this story now. And so um, those are two things I didn't anticipate initially as I began the project, but I feel now are, I can't imagine the book any other way. Great. Um, next question from the chat. When do you know when to stop researching? I'm, as we speak on my bedside table, have a book called Shades of Mao by Jeremy Barme. <laughs> and it's about the posthumous Mao cult and how he continued to be popular in the late eighties. I read another article about how he's popular among Gen Z because of what he has to say about income inequality. So, um, so I, I don't know if I'm exactly finished with it. And as I said, more 
interesting evidence or photos still seem to be coming out. Um, but in terms of research, I think it's important to take a hard look at yourself and think, is this replacing, is this a substitute for writing the pages I need to go at? Because there is a tendency again to, well, there's lots of reasons why you tell yourself like, there's no way I can write this book. This is, this is foolish. What am I doing? And, 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 and research is, seems uh, productive on one hand and, and can be useful, but it couldn't, it shouldn't be an excuse for sort of blocking your, your, your ability to write the book. And so um, it's, I don't know, the end of research uh, is, is akin to when someone says like, well, how do you know a book's done when you're, when you're sick of it, when you fall in love with another book. So um, there's part of that as well. But I think maybe the research also has to do with the fact of when you get so excited with your narrative that you're just, you're just racing along and you'll fill in later if necessary. Or again, if this narrative is truly something that you've made your own, um, then research, while it's important, is not the center of the book. It's yeah, a character. For, yeah. For, for me, as I like at some point in research, I saw most of the book in my head or on the pieces of paper that I had scattered around and notebooks and things like that. And that's when I started writing, but the research doesn't really stop at that point. I, I stopped maybe reading books to fill my brain, but I'm constantly looking things up or Googling things. Or I fortunately had a brother who was an expert in the field. And occasionally I would just call him for, for a very quick answer instead of finding it myself. And so uh, the research process, there's two phases. There's like the intense, all I'm doing is research phase. And then there was the uh, writing and needing research along the way because I had very technical details or historical details I needed to look up. So, right. There, I think there's research that can serve as inspiration. And once you've got your story going, you realize, oh, I need to sort of backfill and find something mm -hmm. to 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 help me understand what how to shape my um, what's happening. Yeah. One more from the chat. Uh, your wonderful column in the SF Chronicle draws me back to the back page every Friday. In it, you talk a lot about your family. How do you balance family with writing a column and novels? Thank you for reading uh, every week. Uh, I do really cherish the relationship with uh, my readers because I know they're getting the paper every week and maybe over the kitchen table. And um, I really cherish that. So in terms of being able to balance it, I guess a couple of things. The guilt probably sometimes never goes away. Right now, they're on the other side of my door doing, you know, not with me. So, but I also came to the understanding that to be the best mother to them was to be engaged and happy and doing something that I love too. And, you know, there have been studies that um, families where the mom uh, works outside the house or well, I guess this is pre-pandemic, but you know, is engaged in work. Um, their sons are much more likely to be equitable in future relationships. So I, I tell myself that. But in terms of just juggling it all, um, it's about making most of the time that I do have. Um, and so sometimes that means, uh, like this week's column is about um, Disneyland and sort of a controversial new line hopping program they have installed, but. It was inspired when we went down to Disneyland uh, a few weeks ago. Or um, I'm writing about Guo Pei, a fashion designer, um, in an upcoming column. She has a new exhibit uh, at the Legion of Honor, but we brought the kids along. And so, you know, we, we saw part of the exhibit, then my husband took him outside and I sped walked through the rest of it. So it's a matter of figuring out things that are, uh, you know, enriching and we can be together, but yet at the same time, I, I have all I can still find a way to, to write about it. Right. So real quick break in the questions to announce the raffle winners. Uh, our raffle winners, I'm going to put this in the chat as well, are Nadia Saeed and Tony Ann Johnson. So Nadia and Tony, if you will send an email to me with your mailing address in the body of the email, uh, my email address is zach.powers at writer.org, and that just went into the chat window. So please, congratulations, your win, and please send me an email, and we'll get those out to you uh, as soon as they are published. So um, uh, it'll be a couple weeks yet before that actually happens, but we'll, we'll go ahead and order them now, and they will be delivered to you hopefully on or about shortly after the release date. More questions in the chat window. I, I, my questions are no longer needed, needed in that meeting. <laughs> 
Um, how does your writing process determine the chapter definitions and how long did you plan to make the novel? Was it longer or shorter than you envisioned the, sh envisioned the story to be? That's interesting. And I have a couple things to say about it. So the very first draft I wrote, I wrote 150 pages in my first year of grad school. And then I thought, okay, I, I'd like to finish it this summer. Hmm. Novels, I think, are about 300 pages. <laughs> and I have five days a week for the next three months. Let me calculate how many pages per day that is. And I thought, okay, that's actually um, three to four pages a day, double spaced. And that made it a manageable goal. And lo and behold, I, I finished it uh, at the end of the summer and then workshopped it uh, my second year. And so now this book, it actually ha used to have another timeline. Chinatown, instead of just Chinatown in 1976, instead of just being the prologue and epilogue was perhaps 30% of the book. Um, and so at certain points, I think the manuscript swelled to more, over 400 pages um, and it just was too much, too much. And some of, again, I don't regret it. Some of it ended up in um, A River of Stars, sort of the character and setting, which is set in San Francisco's Chinatown. Um, and so now it's 368 pages. And in terms of chapters, there was a point maybe somewhere late in the process where I'd, I, on one hand had, uh, you know, established chapters based on, okay, this feels like a good jump, you know, point to halt. But then I sat there and I wrote out all the chapters and figured out that some were really long and some, like they were lopsided. Like I had accidentally had a chapter that was maybe, I don't know, 30 pages long. And so I realized I went through and thought about what are other places where it might balance it out. And in fact, in the middle section where in books often can start to feel like they're dragging, I had, I decided to have shorter chapters. And so that, um, I mean, chaptering is, is a really interesting art. Um, and, you know, it, it, it was something that came over time that there's like with anything you, you draft your book, you draft your chapters. And so if you take an analytical, analytical eye afterwards, um, then you can sort of determine if that's the best rhythm or tempo, uh, the, you know, for the chapters. Uh, another question from the chat. Can you talk more about your process on studying the natural world and how it stirred in your head before the descriptions landed on the page? Oh, wait, so we let me look at that question again. Yeah. Um, studying the natural world. Um, so, and this is actually interesting and I'll mention that I became a forager during the pandemic and it had to do in part with all the hikes my family was taking and just, you know, discovering miners, lettuce for the first time, blackberries, food everywhere, if you knew where to look. Um, but part of it came, my, my interest in it, I think came in part from, you know, I loved pioneer stories, little Laura Ingalls little house when I was a kid and I, there was that same impulse in me, but also as a writer, I, I, I thought I want to be a part of the landscape more than just taking a photo in the botanical garden, right? So this had long been a desire of mine in the writing of this book um, and, and the pandemic, which um, sort of was at the tail end of the revising and writing of it, um, I think helped, you know, re re it's reflected in that. But in terms of just thinking about the natural world, uh, you know, you can always, you look at the resources that are available to you, whether that's photos online or going into an herbalist shop or, you know, whatever you, you may be able to, to access. Um, but again, if, if it's, it's about drawing upon not only the research, but what, what sort of pre-existed, what, you know, the love of the natural world or, uh, what it means to, what it feels like to walk a dusty road when you're backpacking, how does that translate to understanding what it's like to, you know, go on the journey that may takes across the country. Um, so, so the, the setting, it's not just like, oh, I, it's something I pictured in my head. It's, it's based not only on the research, but just the life I've lived up to this point. And that's, and I think, um, 
often people are very curious about influence or things that are very uh, directly one-to-one -one correspondence. Like I did this and it's this is exactly how I portrayed it. But so much about fiction or creative work is comes in sideways, right? Comes in through our subconsciousness, which we can't directly um, access, but anything I wrote in the book, um, it wasn't, you know, the thoughts I had in my head visualizing it, they came from the life experiences I had up until that point. Great, thank you. Another chat question, how much do you plan plot out your novel? And if you did, how much did the story deviate from your plotting? So often writers can be divided into two camps, plotters and pantsers, meaning you fly by the seat of your pants. <laughs> and I am the latter. Um, I consider the first draft to be the, 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 the outline in a way, because, uh, because I'm, I'm still working out who the characters are. Um, I might have, I, I know, and it, it always starts with that premise. Like, how do I, um, who, who is this person? How did she end up in this situation and how would she find her way through it? Um, so, but I am a big believer in what I call uh, reverse engineering or outlining after you've written the first draft or actually all along the way, because, um, you know, I do spreadsheets or sometimes it's just a long list, but basically I'll do a scene by scene breakdown. And that's um, when you can really see if a concern or character just disappeared or needs to be picked up or carried. Or I remember novelist Leslie Tenorio talked about like, how do you figure out the ending for a short story or a, a novel? Um, look for the clues, Hi use highlighters to pick out things that you didn't realize your subconscious or your imagination kept manifesting. And that is the way through. And in, in some ways, um, the further you, you know, the, the blank page at the start of a 300 page project is very daunting, but the further you get in, the more that you've established in some ways, I'm not gonna say coming up with the end is easy, but you, it's easier than when you were at the beginning, because at least for me, that's, I've come to a better understanding of the characters and, and the world. Um, and so um, in terms of how much did it deviate from my plotting, uh, I just, I let myself be open to what, what could happen. So I, um, it, yeah, yeah, so. Uh, I'm passing over a couple questions in the chat. They were good questions. I just feel that we hit on them at least a little bit so far already. So sorry to pass your questions, but we don't have a lot of time left. So I want to make sure we're, we're covering some new territory. Next question. This is an interesting one to me. Do you feel the book gained in complexity or became more streamlined as you wrote your various drafts? Yeah, I've thought about this, that drafts, especially for a book that was written over the course of like 2007 to, to 2021 <laughs> um, was almost like an accordion. <laughs> and that's OK, because sometimes after you get feedback, you need to go a bit maximalist to realize you need to experiment and, and try it out. And if it doesn't work, at least you'll have known that for cert with, with certainty that that was not the direction you, you um, didn't want to go to. So. For me, I I, uh, I think it's, yeah, the, so in some ways um, it's longer than what my first draft was, shorter than it's ever been. And yet I don't think there's anything in the book that doesn't belong there because it took, that process uh, allowed me to truly understand and see, um, of course, with the help of my editor and, and agents, just what the heart of the story was. And in, in that way, hopefully, by the time a book is published, it's as streamlined, it's as long as it needs to be, and it's as streamlined um, as it can be. Great. So here's another question. We've covered some writing process, but there's a little bit more specific here. So what's your writing process? Do you make an outline, chart, notebooks? How do you organize all the brilliant ideas that end up coming into the novel? A bunch of files in a folder that in variously named folders or um, for a time I had photos of uh, from the Cultural Revolution pasted up um, on my room. I have maps that are, are still up. Um, and so I don't know if it was, it's not indexed in the way that, I don't know, files at the Library of Congress would be, but it in some ways, anything I gathered and in all the ways I gathered it are 
a sort of, um, I think Elena Ferrante calls it Frantu Manglia, like the, the, the stew. <laughs> and so um, picture that rather than a filing cabinet. Um, you may get your, you get your hands dirty if you, if you reach in, but I think, um, I think that's a better approximation of how I, you know, kept track of things. And sometimes it did mean I might have to look them up again uh, because I couldn't find it, but, but, but I knew it was there. So um, for me, that's what's worked. I know some people love programs like Scrivener. There's a timeline program called Aeon. Um, but I just tend to be more simplistic. I lay things out in an Excel spreadsheet um, or yeah, I cobble it together. So I don't, I don't quite have a system. So this next question I was refraining from asking myself as the official host of the event. So I'd like to thank Tammy for asking it in the chat and allowing <laughs> me to bring it up. So curious about the Keanu Reeves pillow and the story behind it. So uh, I have uh, two friends, uh, writer friends, Asian American writers, uh, Beth Wynn and Amy Fun. And during the pandemic, we kept sending each other surprise presents. <laughs> um, and one day, uh, Keanu was one round of the presents. And um, I think he's a quarter Chinese. And so we, we claim him. <laughs> so... <laughs> That, that, that's that's excellent and uh i i believe we are all keanu fans so <laughs> yes. uh we're, we're a little low on time and i think i've hit all the questions in the chat so i'm gonna i have one, one thing i want to talk about that i think was really good to bring up from this book is characterization because i think there's really really interesting characterizations on a lot of levels the main players are all many layered they're very interesting um and so i'd like to talk a little bit with you about how you think about characterization starting with with the narrator May, she's both young, sheltered, naive from a secluded village without much worldly experience or cosmopolitan mm -hmm. or whatever kind of spirit you want to call it. But she's also cunning and ambitious. She's not, she's not adult. She's very smart and, and picks up on the stuff going on around her. So she's a very interesting character that ex will simultaneously ex display in a saying both these, both these aspects of her personality. How did she go from being an idea for a character, from being one of these, maybe one of these girls you saw in the photo to becoming uh, a, a living, breathing person that I feel like I know after having read the book. Um, thank you so much for that uh, description of her and for seeing so deeply into the book. Um, so I think May, in my very earliest draft, I tempted a short story that was set at one of the party scenes. She was anonymous. I think she was called the girl. Um, but then I, when I, again, wondered like, there's more to this, I, Drew upon my experiences as a journalist, I've been, um, I went to China for the first time in 2004, and I visited rural villages, I also went to factories, I hung out with these barely out of teenage girls who left their home, ridden the train for, for days, sitting straight up, um, and we, you know, we went to a bar, we were playing some dice game that, whose rules I never figured out, um, and though the life was was hard. They worked six days a week, very long hours. They had a life different than the one handed down to them. And they, for out of a sense of you know wanting to support their family, or also probably to you know a desire to see a bigger world, left home. And even though May is from a different era, decades earlier, I knew that wanting to leave for the big city was not it's immemorial, right? It, it, and, and they say there's only two kinds of stories. A stranger comes to town or a young person goes on a journey. And so for me, this, this very much was a book based on thinking about those who leave and those who stay. And um, in terms of developing your character, I was also mindful that just because someone's from the village or young, you, you can't count them out, that they might have a resourcefulness that they use even as they you know try to resist the the larger structures but i was also mindful that she's she's young she she turned 16 um in the course of the book and so again teenagers everywhere are going to be sort of have those huge uh you know the high so high the low so low the moodiness all of that um which is going to be reflected in say her interactions in the dance troupe um but not only that the way the struggle sessions, the, the sort of rivalries, it's indicative of the cultural evolution to come um, in, in, in the course of the book, that 
uh, uh, sort of this campaign that threw the country into turmoil began in the middle and high schools. And so and before spreading to adults and um, you know factories, school, colleges, uh, students turning on teachers, neighbors against neighbors. And so again, um, the, the cultural revolution for all its grand ideals, you, one way to look at it or a way to look at it is how does it sort of reflect the, the, the score settling, the, the revenge that, that happened on a very personal level. And so um, that's, that, that's how I developed her character, sort of understanding that how she was like teenagers I've, 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 I've met and encountered or written about, and also just how she was reflective of, of, of the, the, those times. I mean, and, and it's, it, she's an impressive character, but she is an adequate foil for the chairman. And I mean, that is not a small thing. This is a hugely powerful person and she is believably able to navigate that space successfully. So that was, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, I did want to, to jump to one other topic too, which was contemporary influence. And you mentioned this a little bit in the afterward too, and it's interesting to me, which is while well, historical fiction looks backward, um, I think the best of it also looks to the present, perhaps to the future, but definitely to like, that there's some myth of timelessness that I think gets brought up, like, well, it should exist without any rep, but no, the, you wrote the book now, it has to have some connection to now in some way. So how do you let current issues, perspectives, and knowledge influence your interpretation of past events? How much do you try to keep this narratorial voice in the past, and how much do you let a modern perspective seep in? I definitely wanted to make sure what I wrote wasn't anachronistic, <laughs> yet at the same time, in the course of this novel, the Me Too movement rose up both in the US and in China. Um, we saw the rise of demagoguery, but China again became sort of uh, an enemy to the US. And so all these things not mentioned in the novel itself, nonetheless shaped my thinking. Uh, take for example, the pandemic, just how many of us really thought about isolation and separation and distance from family in new and poignant ways. And I have to think that's what entered the novel as well. And there's been questions like, what will be pandemic literature? What, and, and some of it, um, to go back to the sort of sideways metaphor, it's gonna be through windows and not the front door. It's, it's going to be in books set in the future, set in the past, um, that again, are nonetheless influenced by how we were all changed um, in, in the last few years. Well, I think it's interesting too that the unintended connection to more recent moments, like doing my own very limited research into the Cultural Revolution, I like this is the thing we should have been talking about in recent American history. This is the historical thing that felt most like what we were experiencing yeah. in our country, and it wasn't getting much much play, probably because of racism and other issues and, cult and colonialism and, and other things that pushed pushed a different perspective aside. But so that was. But again, you said you started this book 14 years ago, so it obviously predated that. And my novel is set in Russia and Ukraine, and it was published years ago and written even farther ago. So, you know, there is sometimes you realize you're a little more prescient than you thought you were when you were tapping into some, some something in the cultural moment of your location and your time that actually is resonating with with the past events that you're writing about. So. Well, it's like how you uh, will the the beach into being. You sort of will the 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 synchronicities into being. Yeah. Oh, we're we're getting near the end, so I think I will go to our final question, unless anyone's going to pop a last minute question in the chat window. Um, the last question we do like to ask our guests is, what's one piece of advice you'd give to a writer just starting out? To seek out community, and I'll share a story. Um, years ago, I joined the Writer's Grotto in San Francisco on a fellowship, and I walked in for lunch on the first day. Um, there's a wall with all the book covers of members, and I, I felt embarrassed, like a fraud, like I didn't yet have a book. I didn't know if I'd ever have a book. And the woman sitting next to me over lunch, I knew she'd published a well-received memoir, mentioned almost casually to my ear that she was not able to sell her her next book and i don't even know if she remembers me her sharing that with me but it was a revelation that there are these ups and downs and that community is really important in the ways that we can commiserate when times are hard 
but also celebrate uh, when there's cause for celebration. And that's why I'm so excited to see, you know, friendly and familiar faces on this Zoom and for the upcoming events ahead um, that I have, because every book is a miracle. And it is, and I'm, I'm so happy to be able to sell other, celebrate other people's books um, and to, to kind of thank all those who supported and encouraged me along the way, um, including all of you tonight. Really, thank you. Thank you. I, we're, we're the Writer Center, we're a community, we're all about the community space too, so we yeah. agree with that. And there's so much knowledge about writing, there's so much support for writers, there's so much knowledge about publishing and wisdom out there that no one person has. So while there's the necessary solitary moments of writing that they're, uh, most of the writers I know who really, really do a lot of work have, have those branches out into the broader community. So thank you for mentioning that. I really appreciate it. Um, I just wanna thank uh, everyone again for coming out and joining us this evening. Please, please, please buy a copy of Forbidden City or at least get a copy at your library or wherever else you might borrow a book. Um, it's, it's worth your time. It's a fascinating read. It's an educational read. It's a moving read. It's the kind of read that I like that cut, sort of hits all the bases at one time. So Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us and spending your time with us this evening, at least on the East Coast. I assume it's maybe late afternoon there still for you. I'm not sure. I... Yes, about to head off to the school's maker fair after this. So thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the Maker Fair, uh, and thanks everyone again for coming out.